Well, Anthony, great to speak with you. Thanks for taking the time. Larry Kudlow, of course, just named the director of the NEC for President Trump, and already he is commenting on markets, endorsing a strong dollar, uh, talking about the Fed, warning them not to overdo it, and, of course, targeting China as well. How long will this marriage last between President Trump and Larry Kudlow? Uh, well, I, well, first of all, it's great to be on. I think the marriage lasts a long time because... What you find with the president, he gets long-lasting commercial marriages or political marriages when people are philosophically in sync with him and he enjoys their personality. And so you're going to get the combination of those two things. The other thing Larry's not capable of, he's not going to say nasty things behind the president's back when he leaves the Oval Office or the White House residence. So that combination of things is going to lead to a long-lasting marriage. But in addition to that, Larry has prepared his entire life for this job. He knows trade better than anybody. He knows dollar policy better than anybody. He knows the interactions of the Fed better than anybody. And he understands the world trading system and where the imbalances are as it relates to the United States. And he'll be very surgical in terms of explaining that to business leaders. So I predict that business leaders, large and small, across America and internationally, are going to embrace his appointment uh, because he's a great communicator, he's a great policy thinker, and he has a great relatability uh, and likability that the president will clearly respond to. So for all of those reasons, I couldn't be happier with the pick. I, 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 I think Gary is a home run of a guy as well. I think Gary's going to go on to do great things and maybe even return to the administration. Uh, but uh, he couldn't have picked a better person than Larry Kudlow. Um, as you say, uh, Larry is very used to having the public eye. He's a good communicator. There has been some suggestion that that could present a problem for him, that those uh, who have joined this White House, who have been visible and good communicators, uh, that they run the risk of overshadowing the president. Is that a risk for Larry Kudlow? I, I don't see that at all. I, I don't see anybody, quote unquote, overshadowing the president. I mean, he's a obviously larger than life uh, personality, uh, and he is the force behind the administration. I think what what has sometimes happened in the administration is that people have a mixed relationship with him, uh, or they may not be on side with him in terms of his his policies. Because you have to remember. Uh, the president is trying to put the American workers first, the American middle class and lower middle class families first as it relates to his economic agenda. And I think that rubs some fellow Republicans or establishment Republicans the wrong way. Uh, that won't rub Larry the wrong way. Larry understands uh, the need for that. Larry understands that the way to grow aggregate demand in our society and to create global growth is to put more disposable income in the hands of middle class people. You're not going to grow faster than one to one and a half percent on government demand and wealthy individuals demand in the economy. You're going to have to download higher wages to middle class people, lower middle class people, which will effectuate that growth. So I don't see him overshadowing at all. Um, I, I see him as an elder statesman in the uh, World Economic uh, Intellectual Academy, if you will. And I see him as somebody that the president is not only going to like, but trust. And, and I, I predict that the president will offer Larry his proxy once they get super comfortable with each other on a lot of ideas. Anthony, it, it seems like the president trusts people who agree with him, that he, he recently has been firing people who do not. Is that a problem, that he now appears to be surrounding himself with people who are yes-men, that there are not enough divergent I, opinions in the White I don't, House? I don't agree. I, I have to take issue with that. I don't agree with that, actually, at all, because I think, I think what he doesn't like is the breach. He doesn't like, if you disagree with him and you're inside the tent and you're, in, you're inside the war room disagreeing with him, that's one thing. If you're walking outside of the tent and you're snickering about him in a Georgetown salon trying to impress Washington establishment uh, sycophants, uh, and that's another thing. And so to me, I think the president's a very strong leader. He said last week at a press conference that he likes some of the uh, intellectual discourse. He likes some of the rigor of people going at each other. Mm. But what he doesn't like is after they leave the room trying to act like they're falsely superior to him. Right, and so, so keeping so everything that's in the house. Stuff, that's the stuff he doesn't like. He doesn't mind the disagreement. I, I had the opportunity, still do for that matter, 
uh, to challenge some of the things that he does and to question some of the things that he does. But I do that quietly, and I do that in a privileged conversation, uh, and I remain loyal to him and loyal to his agenda. Well, and, so, and I think Larry's fully capable of doing that. Speaking of those conversations that one would have with the president, um, I want to talk about gatekeepers here. And I know that, Anthony, you're no fan of the chief of staff, John Kelly, but as a practical matter, does President Trump, or any president for that matter, need gatekeepers? One single person can't be on top of all the granular details of every issue, and it's reasonable to have someone filter the things that people do want to approach him with. Well, you know, I'll, I'll use a, a line that the president often uses when he's contemplating change. He says, we'll see. You know, we'll, we'll see about that. We'll see how things turn out. I think, I think what the president is finding uh, 12, 13 months into the job, uh, that his instincts are uncanny as it relates to the American people. His instincts on policy have actually been astoundingly good. Just look at the markets. Yes, there's been some near-term volatility recently, but if you look at the markets and you look at the way allies are now going to deal with us on trade and create more symmetry on trade, and you think about uh, the things that the president is pushing as it relates to accountability on NATO and the potential denuclearization of North Korea, these are all very, very positive things. And you're, you're asking me a question of whether or not he needs a gatekeeper. I've seen him operate in business for 10 or 12 years. And I will tell you that he likes a little bit of a freewheeling system. And so if he's got, if he's got a gatekeeper, uh, the gatekeeper should probably adapt more to his personality than try to uh, get the president, who's about to be 72 years old in June, to adapt to the gatekeeper's personality. So, so I hear you. I didn't, I didn't like that book, by the way. I thought the book was uh, uh, inaccurate in a lot of ways on a lot of these people and their, and their personalities as it related to being chief of staff to uh, uh, a lot of the president. So I hear you but I disagree with a lot of it. Uh, obviously, you have your own uh, opinion on the folks who are inside the White House at this point. As you know, there's been a lot of reporting that Tillerson is not going to be the last to be dismissed, perhaps even in the very short term. Uh, if you were giving counsel to the president, and I'm sure that you uh, still at times are, uh, who would you recommend should be the personnel perhaps next to leave the White House? I, I, I would recommend the president to uh, uh, Go with his gut on people. I would recommend to the president uh, to put a system in place of people that feel very strongly about his ideas and feel very strongly about him as a human being. Um, I, would go, I, I would go to that more than I would go to any one individual. Uh, I think that, uh, that Washington thought that uh, Donald J. Trump was going to descend upon Washington and they were going to morph him into Washington's image which has frankly been a disaster for the American people. The swamp has actually failed the American people over the last generation. And so, so what I find fascinating about what's happening now, the president has descended upon Washington, and rather than Washington morphing him, he's in the process of morphing Washington. And so when you see these changes being made, uh, if you're in Washington, you run around with your hair on fire, but if you're a New Yorker and you're an entrepreneur, you recognize that these changes are very natural. Well, Anthony. You recognize that turnover like this is, is incumbent to startups. And frankly, I've done two startups uh, in the financial services industry yeah. and experienced a lot of turnover early on. Anthony, I got to push back on you on the on the swamp notion, however, because we have uh, been hearing from some of the members of the administ administration who allegedly are taking private flights on taxpayers' dimes. We, of course, had the story about Ben Carson and the uh, expensive dining set for his office, for example. Uh, there's still various investigations of the Trump Organization's business dealings and how that relates. Uh, to government. Um, so at this point, how can the president credibly still say that he's draining the swamp? I didn't, I didn't say he's draining it. I think he's, he, I think he's discovering that it may be a gold-plated hot tub. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily know if the swamp is actually drainable. You're bringing up one-off incidents, but I, I'm talking more about the swamp as a business model uh, where special interests and lobbyists curry favor with elected officials to maintain the order of what is sometimes called crony capitalism. What and I'm, what is, I'm talking and how about. How is that no longer happening? I mean, you can take the example. For, I didn't say that it of, wasn't. Okay. I didn't, oh, so I'm what sorry. Is, I did not. I did not say that it wasn't. I said that the American people put him in there because they don't like it. They don't like the practices of Washington. The approval rating for the Congress is down to where the North Korean dictator is. I've heard John McCain say 
that it's down to paid staff and family members. It may be down only to paid staff at this point. You know, people do not like what's going on in Washington. And Anthony. I didn't say... I didn't say the president's changing it. I said he's trying to. Right. People don't like what's going on in Washington. And if you look at the Pennsylvania special election results, you could make the argument that they don't like what's happening with President Trump as well, because Rick Saccone, who aligned himself very closely with the president, um, got a, was pretty well challenged by Connor Lamb. What is your take on, on that election? And what does it say about uh, the public's response to what President Trump has been doing? I, I, I don't think it says as much as some people want it to say. Uh, uh, Connor Lamb was a conservative Democrat, gun-toting Democrat in that district. I, I would say that we have to operationalize as a Republican Party a little bit stronger. There has to be a closer nexus between the White House and the field. Uh, we've got 23 seats that are at risk. And if we lose those seats, we're going to lose the House. And so uh, up against that, you have very good macroeconomic data where you have rising wages in those districts and more disposable income. People typically vote with their pocketbooks. In that specific instance, uh, with the, the district potentially going away, uh, the, the, the amount of money spent uh, by the Democrat relative to the Republican, and, and frankly, you know, the president visited the district once, and uh, if, if we're going to do an autopsy on it, we probably needed more of the president's surrogates out in that district, in addition to his son, other people. Uh, but yes, I hear you. Uh, uh, presidents typically, first term presidents, have a difficult time in con congressional midterms. To use Barack Obama's own words from 2010, he said he was shellacked when he lost 63 seats. Right. And so we still we still have time as a Republican Party to put this together, uh, but we got to get back into the locker room and redesign huh. our offensive strategy here if we want to keep the House. Anthony, just got to leave with one question that has nothing to do with politics, um, and that has to do with Skybridge, uh, your firm. I'm just wondering if you can give us an update on where you are with the sale, the approval process. You told our Eric Schatzker at the end of January in Davos you might even consider consider rejoining the firm uh, in a more active capacity. Talk, talk us through what's going on. Well, listen, the firm is having a pheno phenomenal year. Uh, I'm, I'm, I can't, unfortunately, talk about the performance on TV, but I would tell people to look at the performance. Uh, if you look at the performance relative to volatility, uh, the firm the firm is having an, probably arguably its best year ever uh, in terms of that separation. Uh, so in some ways, the firm is probably benefiting from my absence. But but what I what I would say to you is that it would be hard pressed for me to believe that this firm is a direct threat to the nation's national security to team itself up with H and uh, But we're in the process now. I think that was reported by you guys. Let's see what that intergovernmental agency says, and then obviously I'll be able to comment on it more publicly. But when I step back and look at SkyBridge as a diversified fund of funds that's done an amazing job for its clients, I don't see a national security reason to delay or to not approve the sale. But that'll be up to the government uh, to make that decision. And once they do, I promise you that I'll come on and I'll talk about it very publicly and very candidly.